So we'd like to begin as we did last night by singing first of all with Sad Goswami Astikam, which glorifies of course the six Goswamis and then we will continue to speak on the pastimes of Lord Chaitanya with Rupa and Sanatan. Krishna Kirtan Nathananta
night we were speaking about Rupa Goswami, how he was, how he was able to uh, get out from his employment in the service of the Nawab Hussein Shah and go and join Lord Chaitanya. Rupa Goswami went along with his brother Anupam. After a short time, Anupam, however, left his body and Rupa Goswami was left alone. However, Anupam had a son and that son grew up to be Jiva Goswami. And it was Jiva Goswami who later on came to Vrindavan and lived there with his uncles Rupa and Sanatan and uh, later on Jiva Goswami became the leader of all the Goswamis in Vrindavan and of course he wrote profusely scriptures and he also did so many things to establish Gaudiya Vaishnavism within the holy land of Vrindavan. So we were speaking about Rupa Goswami last night so tonight we're going to speak about Sanatana Goswami. There are two brothers, and Sanatana was the older brother. Can, can you turn this fan off? So Sanatana Goswami was a very dear associate of the Nawab Hussein Shah. And the Nawab Hussein Shah thought of him like a younger brother. Now the Nawab Hussein Shah was engaged in leading his army and conquering uh, different kingdoms, surrounding kingdoms like Orissa. And he requested Sanatana Goswami, who at that time was called Sakara Malik, he was requesting him to even come with him, to go with him and join his army. But of course, Sanatana Goswami had no interest in this. His interest had already been taken by Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. And Sanatana was desiring to get out of his service to the Nawab. But the Nawab was very attached to Sanatana Goswami. He wanted to keep him in his service. So Sanatana arranged some trickery. He did not go to the job. Instead, you know, he sent some message saying, not well and sick. And so, after some time, the Nawab sent his physician to find out what was the problem. And his physician came back and said, oh, there's nothing wrong with him, actually. He's perfectly well. So then the Nawab Hussein Shah came personally to visit the residence of Sanatan. And he found that Sanatana was engaged there in studying Srimad Bhagavatam along with many other brahmanas. Actually, Sanatana and Rupa had already performed uh, various activities to prepare themselves for entering into spiritual activities and giving up their material duties. And. Uh, they had done things like uh, performing sacrifice and then offerings to the ancestors and then feeding the brahmanas, doing different things like this, all uh, purificatory activities to prepare them to give up their material duties. And then Rupa Goswami had gone off and Sanatan was not able to immediately leave home but he was engaged at, in his residence discussing Srimad Bhagavatam with about 20 brahmanas who were all there. So when the Nawab came to his home and saw all of this, then he was angry with Sanatan. And he told Sanatan how much he was depending on him to run the government because the Nawab would go out fighting and conquering and he expected Sanatan to look after all the affairs of the state. But Sanatan was already disgusted with this kind of work. He didn't want to associate with these people anymore and he desired 
go off and join Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. So he had to find a way how to get free. But when the Nawab saw him like this, the Nawab was telling him, you come with me, we will go and fight. But Sanatan said, no, I don't, I cannot go, I will not go with you. So then the Nawab became angry and he ordered him to be arrested. And Sanatan was put into prison. He was made a prisoner. So from being a very big man in the government, he became a prisoner in the, in the jail. However, uh, Sanatan was uh, a very clever person, very highly educated and very diplomatic, and he knew how to deal with people. So the, the jailer uh, was made, Sanatan was able to make the jailer a very, uh, have, a, have a nice friendship with him. And, uh, Rupa Goswami, before he had retired, I explained yesterday, he had left 10,000 gold coins with one of the grocers there. And that money was available for Sanatan in some emergency purpose. So Sanatan Goswami made use of this money to bribe the jailer. And he told the jailer that if, if you let me go free, I will give you these gold, I will give you these gold coins, a huge amount of wealth, of gold. But the jailer was concerned, he said, well, I will get in trouble if you just disappear. But Sanatan said, no, he said, you simply tell them that you took me, you, you took me to the banks of the Ganges and I went there to pass through and when I got to the banks of the Ganges, I jumped in. And I had all my shackles and chains on, and I drowned. So you simply tell them like that, that I was carried away by the current of the Ganges, and you could not find my body. And he, he, he promised the jailer, he said, you let me go free, and I promise I'm going to go to Mecca. I want to go on pilgrimage to the holy land of Mecca. So the Muslim jailer was very pleased. He thought, well, this is certainly a pious activity. If I let him out of jail and he goes to Mecca, he will perform this pilgrimage. And so the jailer also being tempted by the gold coins, he agreed. So it's interesting to note here that sometimes devotees have to use cheat trickery. We have to cheat sometimes people. And there's a statement like that, actually, in the Srimad Bhagavatam, where uh, Maharaj Yudhisthira is talking about Vidura and Dhritarashtra. And he says, I have been cheated by these great souls. And Srila Prabhupada writes in the purport that it is certainly a fact that great souls may cheat. We may be surprised to think, oh, great souls, they should not cheat. But he said, great souls cheat for a great cause, right? For a great cause they can cheat. And we do have examples in the, our line of great souls cheating for a great cause. Uh, just like uh, Sanatan Goswami cheated the jailer, he was able to escape from jail. Similarly, also Raghunath Das Goswami had to use some trickery in order to escape from his home because his family were very attached to him and they did not want him to become a full-time devotee. But Raghunath was able to use some trickery to escape from the home. And then Srila Prabhupada also in his, in his own life he did a little trickery with his family that he asked his wife, do you want tea or me? So she said, well, I'd rather have tea. And so then Prabhupada took it, that all right, then I can go, you know, and he took this as an opportunity to leave home. And he never came back. And so he cheated his family members and then, uh, 
we see also uh, Ramanuja Acharya also was a, in family line and he tricked his wife so that he could become a sannyasi, arranged for his wife to go home. He said, your father wants you, some urgent thing, you should go immediately. And she went home and then Ramanuja took that opportunity to become sannyasi. He tricked his wife. So trickery is sometimes there, used by great souls for an, a great purpose. So Sanatana Goswami used that trickery to get out from the jail. He bribed the jailer with the gold coins and the jailer released him. So Sanatan then made his way and he had one servant who was following him, one servant called Ishan was followed, coming with him where he went. And Sanatana Goswami, along with his servant, they came to a, a, a mountainous region and it was difficult to cross over this mountainous region. And it was coming to dark, so Sanatana and his servant took shelter in a lodging house on the way. But when they were in this lodging house, in this lodging house, there was one astrologer. And this astrologer predicted, he said, these, these, this, these two men, one of these two men, the servant, is carrying eight gold coins. And he told the landlord about this. And when the landlord heard this, he was planning to kill the two men. He said, in the, in the night, I will kill them and run and take these gold coins because eight gold coins was considered a very great amount of money and for a simple man with a small uh, lodging house was a great amount of money so he was tempted to do this sinful act of killing the two guests. However, Sanatana Goswami, a very intelligent person, he saw how this hotel keeper was being very nice to them. He was being nice beyond the normal course of what is expected from a, from a landlord. You know, usually landlords are not very nice. If you have the experience of staying in these different kinds of places. You know, they, they have a lot of people coming and going and they're not usually very nice. And, but this, this particular man he was being very nice to Sanatan and his servant. And Sanatan was suspicious that why is he being so nice to us? And then he understood that something is wrong. So then he questioned his servant that have you, are you carrying some valuables with you? And then the servant confessed that he had brought with him and he, he, he said, uh, seven, seven gold coins. So Sanatana Goswami then said to him, why, why have you brought this death toll on us? Because carrying money into a place, into this remote region is very dangerous. That certainly people will kill us for it. So Sanatana Goswami then took the, the seven coins from his servant and he gave it to the landlord and he told the landlord, please take this money. And the landlord was very overwhelmed, he was surprised, said, oh, uh, why are you doing like this? And the landlord even confessed to Sanatana that, you know, I, I was even planning to rob you and kill you to get this money. But you're giving it voluntary. It's very kind of you. You must be a very pious kind of person to do this. You must have some kind of uh, great powers that you can understand my mind. And you've saved me from performing the sin of killing people. And so he said, actually, I, now I, I think you should keep the money. I don't want to take it. But Sanatan said, if you don't take it, then some other people will kill us for it. So you please take it and relieve us of this money. But of course, 
the, the servant had only given seven coins and the landlord said, I knew you were carrying eight coins. So Sanatan understood that his servant was keeping one coin for himself. So Sanatan then requested the servant, you kindly go home and you take your one coin with you and go back. I don't need you to come with me any further. And so the servant returned and the landlord arranged for Sanatan to cross through the forest. He arranged for four watchmen to accompany him through the forest in the night and they were able to cross over the mountainous region. So in this way, Sanatana Goswami was able to continue his journey and he came to a town where it turned out one of his relatives was there. He had a relative named Srikanta and this Srikanta was his brother-in-law. He was married to one of Sanatana Goswami's sisters. And this Srikanta was also a government worker. And he was engaged in purchase, purchasing horses, which were used for the, the army of the Nawab. So he was there purchasing horses. And he saw Sanatan. He saw him in the daytime. He did not immediately speak to him. He was surprised to see his brother because his brother was looking very dirty and wearing, you know, not, not, he usually he would be dressed in very fine clothes, but he was wearing soiled clothes. So he was surprised to see his brother-in-law in this condition. So he came in the evening to meet him. And he requested him, he said, please come and stay with me and I will give you nice dress and I will dress you as a gentleman and I will take care of you. And Sanatan immediately said, I won't stay with you for even one moment. I want to go immediately. Please help me to cross the Ganga. So Srikanta saw the determination of Sanatan that he was very determined to go away from his uh, career of being a big politician in the government of the Mohammedans and he wanted to go and join Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. So his brother-in-law Sri Kanta gave him a woolen blanket at that time. He said, anyway, take this blanket, it will keep you warm in the night, in the cold of the night. And so Sanatan took that blanket with him and with the help of Sri Kanta, he was able to cross the Ganga. And after crossing the Ganga, then it took him a few more days to come to Banaras or Varanasi. And it was there that Sanatana Goswami was able to meet Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Sanatan was very pleased to hear that Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was there in Benares and he was able to locate the residence where he was staying. He was staying actually in the home of a devotee called Chandrasekhar Acharya and there was another devotee there named Tapana Mishra. Lord Chaitanya would regularly take his meals at the home of Tapana Mishra. Tapana Mishra had met Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu before he was a sannyasi when he was traveling in Bangladesh. At that time, Lord Chaitanya had requested Tapana Mishra that if you go to Benares, I will meet you there in the future. So Tapana Mishra had so much faith in Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu that he left his home in Bangladesh and came to live in Benares. And he was waiting there when Lord Chaitanya came to Benares and he was able to serve Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. So as we said, Lord Chaitanya was home in the home of Chandrasekhar at the time. And Lord Chaitanya was sitting in his home. Sanatan came there to the residence of Chandrasekhar and he sat down outside the residence. 
the Lord Chaitanya was inside the residence and he was He's the omniscient Supreme Lord, so he could understand that Sanatan had come there. And he told Chandrasekhar that please go outside and see that Vaish there's a Vaishnava sitting outside your residence. Please go outside and bring him in. So Chandrasekhar went outside and he looked and the, the you know, the the uh, entrance, the courtyard of the home, and he saw there was one Mohammedan mendicant, what is called, the, the, the word is uh, um, Dara, Daravesh, Daravesh. You know that even today there are people who follow this same mode of uh, which Sanatana Goswami or the same appearance which Sanatan had at that time. Sanatan, we said, was working for the Mohammedans. And so he was dressed like a Mohammedan. He had the beard, you know, and he had the mustache, and he had different clothes like a Mohammedan, and some beads, and so on. So uh, when Chandrasekhar came outside, he was looking for a Vaishnava, and he could only see this um, Durabesh, this Mohammedan mendicant. So he came back and told Lord Chaitanya, no, there, there's no Vaishnava out there. So Lord Chaitanya said, is there anyone out there at all? And so he went again and he said, well, there's one Mohammedan mendicant. And Lord Chaitanya said, then bring him inside. So. Chandrasekhar went outside and he requested Sanatana Goswami that Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is inside and he is requesting you also to please come in. And when Sanatana heard this, he was very pleased naturally and he came in and when he came in, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu went towards him and embraced him in great ecstasy. And not only did Chaitanya Mahaprabhu feel ecstasy, but Sanatana Goswami also felt ecstasy. And the two of them were embracing each other, shedding tears in ecstasy of love of God. Because remember, Sanatana Goswami, in his spiritual body, he is one of the associates of Radha and Krishna. Just as Rupa Goswami is uh, Rupa Manjari, Sanatana Goswami is uh, Rati Manjari, or sometimes called Lavanga Manjari. Anyway, he's one of the Manjaris, one of the very intimate associates of Radha and Krishna. So when Sri Chaitanya met Sanatana, he was very joyful and he awakened his ecstatic love for Krishna. And the two of them embraced each other, shedding tears, and Chandrasekhar and Tapan Mishra looked, and they were just astonished to see this. It was such a surprise to them, because they did not know who is this personality, who is this Mohammedan mendicant. However, Lord Chaitanya, and uh, Sanatana Goswami would say to Lord Chaitanya, Oh, please do not touch me, my Lord. I am a sinful person. I am from the most abominable background. Actually, Sanatana Goswami had, uh, he was born in a Saraswata Brahmana family. But somehow, he had fallen into the association of the Mohammedan government. And he had become like them. He had been associating with these cow killers and meat eaters. And he had lost all of his uh, culture by that association. But by the mercy of Lord Chaitanya, he had realized his plight and he made arrangements to get 
out of that situation. And he had come to surrender his life to Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. So when he came to be with Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, he said he had, you know, he grew, grown his hair and he had a beard and so on. It was like a typical Mohammedan. So Lord Chaitanya instructed Chandrasekhar that he, sa he said, go and make him clean. In other words, go and shave him up. And Srila Prabhupada explains, he said, he said, Sanatana Goswami came to Lord Chaitanya like a duravesh, like a, a hippie. Prabhupada uses the term, he said, it's just like a modern day hippie. So he said, when these hippies come, we do not allow them to keep their long hair and beards. And the same example was there with Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and Sanatana Goswami. That when Sanatana came, the first thing Lord Chaitanya had him do was make him clean. Shave his head and cut off that beard also. So Sanatana Goswami was happy to also do this. But uh, Sanatana Goswami, we, we explained, his brother Srikanta, his brother-in-law, had given him this, this expensive woolen blanket. So Lord Chaitanya was looking at this blanket and Sanatana Goswami could feel, you know, that this blanket was taking the attention of Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. So, uh, Sanatana Goswami went to the bank of the Ganges and while he was at the bank of the Ganges, he saw there was another Bengali mendicant there who had a very old torn quilt. So Sanatana Goswami requested this Bengali mendicant that you please give me your torn quilt and take this blanket. And the Bengali mendicant said, oh my dear sir, you are a respectable gentleman. Why are you joking with me in this way? Why would you give me such an expensive blanket in exchange for my old torn quilt? But Sanatana told him, no, I'm not joking, my dear sir. Please kindly accept my proposal. I will be very happy to take your quilt. You please take this blanket. I have no more desire to keep this blanket. So in this way, Sanatana gave away his expensive blanket and took this old torn quilt. And he, Lord Chaitanya also arranged for Sanatan to be given cloth and they were going to give him, they were going to get new cloth for him. But he said, no, I don't want new cloth. Just give me one of your old cloths. So Tapana Mishra brought an old dhoti and so then Sanatan ripped it into two. He made two dhotis because the Babaji's, they wear that you know, they, wear, they don't wear the full length dhoti, they wear the dhoti just down to the knees. So Sanatana Goswami made himself like the, he made two sets of dress for him. And uh, he had this old torn quilt. And then they requested Sanatana, come and take prasadam. But Sanatana said, no, he said, I am going to live by Madhukari. I will simply eat by begging. Madhukari is a system which is still sometimes performed in Braja. If you go on Braja Mandal Parikram, then sometimes the devotees have the opportunity to go to the Bridge Basi people and request some Madhukari. Madhukari, Prabhupada explains the system that you simply go like a bee takes the honey from the flower. So in the same way, you go and beg something from the householder. But you don't take too much. You just take a small portion. 
you don't want to be a burden on the householders. So you simply go and take a small portion. They will give you, you know, maybe one roti or maybe a spoonful of dal, something like this, you see? And so you go to one householder, you take some small quantity, then you go to another person, you take a little more. And in this way, uh, this is Madhukari. So the Goswamis in the time of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, they lived in Vrindavan in this way. But Srila Prabhupada writes that we should not imitate these people. He said today, people who are doing this Madhukari, they're simply imitating Rupa and Sanatana. They're not actually following the tradition which they were doing. They're not doing it in the same mood as Rupa and Sanatana. But they simply do it to be lazy, just simply to, to be like a parasite and to live off others. They don't, they're not doing it as a spiritual discipline. So Srila Prabhupada said, it's much better to accept the prasadam of the deity in the temple rather than to just simply go and do, try to imitate Rupa and Sanatana. So Sanatana Goswami was dis expressing his desire to completely renounce himself, just like we were singing here in the Goswami Astikam. It is described how the Goswamis kicked off all association with the ar aristocracy. They had been associating with the aristocratic people, but these aristocratic people were all sinful. They were all meat eaters and drunkards and even cow killers, and they were associating with them. So they gave up that association. And instead, they accepted loincloths. And how were they living? They were simply living under a different tree every night. We may worry, how would we live if we go out of the house? Rupa and Sanatan, they left everything to go to Vrindavan. They simply depended on Krishna simply depending on Krishna. Sanatana Goswami was saying to Lord Chaitanya that I am a sinful person. My whole life has been associating with materialistic people. Please do not touch me. But Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was praising him. He said that you are actually the real devotee. And he quoted, Lord Chaitanya quoted the verse from Srimad Bhagavatam, which says uh, uh, that one who, uh, the, the, he said, said the, the, the personification of the holy place is the devotee who carries the Lord in her heart. The verse is stated in Srimad Bhagavatam in relation to Vidura coming home after visiting all the holy places. Maharaj Yudhisthira said to Vidura that you are the personification of the holy places because you carry the Lord in your heart. Therefore, you purify the holy places. So, this, was, this is how Lord Chaitanya was glorifying Sanatana Goswami. He said, it's not important to be a Brahmana and simply have all the qualities of a Brahmana, but what is important is to be a devotee. If you're not a devotee, even though you may have all the qualities of a Brahmana, it is useless, it has no meaning. What is important is to be a devotee. You may be a brahmana with so many nice qualities, you will not deliver yourself or your family. But if you are a devotee, if you are a pure devotee of the Lord, then you will deliver your whole family and everyone, the whole country will be benefiting. So Lord Chaitanya was glorifying Chaitanya, uh, Sanatana Goswami. 
And Sanatana Goswami, he had come to Lord Chaitanya uh, to surrender himself and he had questions to ask, just like we're hearing in Srimad Bhagavatam in the morning, Vidura asking questions to Maitreya. In the same way, Sanatana Goswami came before Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and he questioned him. He wanted to know, what is my duty? And he, wants, he wanted to know, who am I? And why are the threefold miseries always giving me trouble? And Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was very pleased to hear these inquiries from Sanatana Goswami. And Lord Chaitanya went on to describe the cause of the distress in the material world. And Lord Chaitanya gave a very nice example about the, 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 the man in distress and the astrologer. The astrologer came to the home of the man. The man was in distress. He, was, he said, I'm very poor. We have no wealth. Our home is poverty stricken. We are all poor. But the astrologer said, oh, you, you're not actually poor. Your father left a great treasure for all of you, but he died away from home. So he was not able to reveal to you where the treasure is hidden. So this is the situation in the material world, actually. We're all in distress and we're not aware of the great wealth which is left for us. This great wealth is left for us in the form of the scriptures and we should take advantage of the scriptures and the knowledge which is there in the scriptures to relieve ourselves from our poverty stricken condition. The astrologer went on to describe that do not dig on the southern side. If you dig on the southern side, you'll simply be bitten by wasps and drones. The southern side is compared to the path of karma kanda, or the path of fruitive activities. If we simply cultivate karma kanda activities, we simply bring so much trouble onto ourselves, because as a result of so many fruitive activity. We simply get more troubles with the material world. We do not get any real solution to the problem of life. The astrologer then said, do not dig on the western side, because on the western side there is a ghost, and that ghost will give you a lot of trouble. You will never be able to put your hands on the treasure if that ghost comes. So this ghost is compared to those who take to the path of Jnana Kanda, speculative knowledge, trying to understand the absolute truth by the power of speculative knowledge. It is like being haunted by a ghost and simply brings one trouble. The astrologer then said, don't dig on the northern side. On the northern side, there's a big black snake and he will swallow you up. You will never get the treasure. The big black snake is compared to the desire for oneness or kaivalya, which is the goal of the mystic yoga process. So in this way, the astrologer was telling how to find the treasure. If you want to get the treasure, you have to go to the eastern side. On the eastern side, quickly you move away the dirt, you will be able to cut, touch the treasure with your own hands. That treasure, of course, is bhakti yoga. When we take to the process of bhakti yoga, then we can experience the real goal of life the real treasure which is available for all of us. So we get this treasure through the knowledge of the Vedic scriptures. Lord Chaitanya gave this example to Sanatana Goswami to instruct him 
and the superiority of the bhakti yoga process over all the other processes of karma and jnana and yoga. That the goal of life is simply to understand Krishna and the process is to serve Krishna and the goal is to love Krishna. So it's all Krishna. To, we want to know Krishna, we want to serve Krishna, we want to love Krishna. This is the principle behind all of the Vedic teachings. The Lord Chaitanya was explaining all of this knowledge in detail to Sanatana Goswami. Actually, they spent some 40 days together discussing the topics of devotional service and Krishna consciousness. So there are many more things to be explained in relation to Lord Chaitanya's teachings to Sanatana Goswami. We will go on tomorrow night to talk more about that. We will stop now and ask if there's any question. We said Rupa Goswami got only 10 days and he heard from Lord Chaitanya at Prayag. Sanatana Goswami is meeting Lord Chaitanya at Benares and they're speaking for 40 days. So many confidential topics, many important points in relation to devotional service are explained directly from the mouth of Lord Chaitanya to Sanatana Goswami. And Sanatana Goswami wrote many books so that we could also have the benefit of these teachings. Okay, any, any question, any comment? Okay, thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Prabhupada Ki. Or Premanande. His Holiness, Bhakti Vikna Vina, Shanarishi, Maharaj Ki. So we'd like to announce that the class will continue tomorrow at the same time and we'd like to invite everyone to come and uh, Maharaj will be leaving uh, for Talo Intan on Thursday and he'll be yeah, Talo Intan and towards the south. He'll be back on Monday and he'll be leaving for Hong Kong on Tuesday. Thank you very much. <laughs>